your boy's back. Your boy, Philanthropy and Focus, your boy, the nonprofit sector, wait for it, connector. Your boy, Tommy D, at the top of my house. If you look above me, that's the roof right there, gang, because we're in my attic, two flights up from the kitchen where I get my coffee. And if you could tell, if you've been here before, I get plenty of coffee. I drink plenty of coffee. I like the caffeine. It keeps me going. All right, listen, I'm fired up because, you know, it's it's just great when kind of your worlds come together. And many, many years ago, probably seven years ago, way before philanthropy and focus was a thing, way before I called myself the nonprofit sector connector, although I did call myself Tommy D back then because I've been doing that for a long time, like, I don't know, 45 years or something like that, you know, from when I was about two and I could say anything, I was calling myself Tommy D. Anyway, way back when we decided at Vanguard Benefits that we were going to have a focus in working with the nonprofit sector and Vanguard Benefits is an employee benefits agency, as you know, and that is kind of part of what set me on this work into the nonprofit sector. I made a post on LinkedIn the other day. Uh, it's also uh, my my cousin Linda passed away a number of years ago and the Lindy Lou Foundation was created. And that sort of set me on this path of what nonprofit was. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll get into more of that kind of that, like the the origin story of the nonprofit sector connector. Maybe we'll talk about that one day. But it's with Vanguard, it, it gives us this opportunity to connect with the nonprofit sector you know, both on the philanthropic side of things, what I like to do, but also on the professional side of things. And, you know, my guest today, we've never kind of networked. We've never kind of had that, you know, hey, man, tell me more about the organization question. And at the same time, Alex Zablocki has been a client of ours. The Public Housing Community Fund has been a client of Vanguard Benefits for a few years now. So first of all, Alex, before I get into my rant and, you know, just, you know, it looks like I forgot about you for four minutes. Let me say hello to you. Let me say, how are you, sir? What's going on? Good morning. Great, Tommy. It's it's a good day. Happy Friday morning. Uh, yeah. Good to see you. And thanks for connecting us and, and bringing us on air today. I'm, I'm fired up to have you here, man, because you know what? Like I say, my mission, I don't know if, you, if I've told you this, but my mission is to do 5,000 episodes of something that used to be an idea. 5,000 episodes of philanthropy and focus. We're right in that 160 mark. Uh, I, I've, I've told people this. I don't know if I've said it much live on the show here, but I will. I want to do the show every morning, Monday through Friday. I want to do the show every single morning because it, what better way to start your day than being inspired by connecting with and learning about the great work that the nonprofit sector and its leaders are doing. So, you know, at the end of Willy Wonka, the original Willy Wonka, he says the little Charlie Bucket, he says, you know, Charlie, don't forget what happened to the little boy who got everything he ever wanted. And he says, what happened, Willie? He goes, he lived happily ever after. And that would make me live happily ever after if every single Monday through Friday I get to do this show. Because what a way, as I say, to help these nonprofits tell their story and amplify their message. And I got to be honest with you, I'm going to lean in and let, tell you a little secret. It's a little bit selfish because it makes me feel really freaking good when I do this. So I like feeling good. Most people probably do. So that's that's the story there. So, Alex, we were originally connected because your organization was getting to a point where you were looking to implement benefits and had been payroll. And there was some transition in the organization in, in a positive way. Maybe we'll talk some of that today. Really, what I want to do is I always do on the show and I'll kind of set it up for some folks who've never been here before. But every week we learn about the leader of the organization, what the organization does the programs, the impact, right? Why is this organization in existence? Then we learn about what's upcoming for the organization. There's a pretty cool program Alex and I were talking about, and it's kind of what reminded me about three weeks ago that, God, I got to get Alex on the show so we could talk about that new program that they have, right? And then it's how can we help? How can we get involved? How can we make an impact? And I say we, because gang, we're creating community, man. That's what this is all about. I know a lot of people pay attention to what I'm doing. I know a lot of people are following what I'm doing. You know, it was around 40, 45,000 people that somehow got access to this show somewhere along the line in 23, 2023. That's kind of a big deal for something that was just an idea I had in my head. So what do I say? All right, here comes a soapbox moment. Gang, if you want to do something, do it. I saw a Jesse Itzler video the other day. If you don't know Jesse Itzler, Google him or send me an email. I'll tell you who he is. But I saw a video the other day and he was talking about how he did a cross country bike ride. I think he's 52 or 54 years old. And he's like, yo, 2024 has got to be the year. You have to do it now because you don't know. We're guaranteed nothing. I'm not going to get like morbid or whatever on you all, but we're guaranteed nothing, man. This moment is what we have. If you want to do something, try it out. I promise you this. The way you thought it was going to work, it's not going to happen that way. There's going to be change. There's going to be ebbs. going to be flows. But at least you freaking move the ball, right? I beat myself up a little bit about this, but I did go around telling everybody for two years that I was going to do a show called Philanthropy and Focus. 
before there ever was a show philanthropy and focus. So it's good to have a vision, but it's also good to jump in with, with at least one foot. You know, I don't know if that would be jumping in or hopping in, jump in, hop in, whatever you want, get something started. So really without further ado, the organization is public housing community fund. The leader is Alex Zablocki. Alex, this is probably not lost on you, but as I was writing notes about 10 minutes ago, I was like, you know, Alex should do a show called From A to Z with Alex <laughs> Zablocki. I was just thinking it out, man. Or like you should have a newsletter from A to Z. Or you should maybe you have these things already and I just didn't know about it. But I'm glad you're here. I I I had to make the A to Z joke because I thought it was cute and funny. It was like AC Ducey. I don't know what it was. It just was coming up for me. I, look, you've been in you and when I look at the notes and stuff like that, you're a veteran public servant. Right. So that's that to me speaks volume. So I wanted you to expand on that thought because I want to know what that means by being a public servant from your perspective. What drew you to this work? I mean, you go back for over 20 years in this space working with the Jamaica Bay uh, Rockaway Park Conservancy down on the peninsula down there. Right. That the, also yeah. worked with New York City Department of Homeless Services. You received your bachelor's degree in finance from Baruch College, Zicklin School. Shout out to Baruch. And then you you continued on to get your community and economic degree, your master's uh, from SUNY Empire State College. Why, man? What was it that drew you to this work? Like, I feel like there's, there's always a story why someone gets brought into what they're doing. So tell yeah, me- to Tommy, thank you. And and first off, we're here at the fund. We're always optimistic and positive about the future. We manifest a lot of things. Um, we wake up every day to execute and get things done. So love the energy. Love it, we're man. I didn't know it. you were manifesting, man. I didn't yeah, know you were, we, I didn't know you had to deal with the universe like I did. Who knew, Alex? Who knew? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I and did that, we, man. We bring those dreams alive and and we make vision become reality. So oh. that's what we're doing here at the fund. But hard to believe, 21 years ago this June, I started in government as an intern at my local council member's office. So I was at Brew College, where I graduated from, proud CUNY grad yep. here in New York City, got my finance degree. I was headed to Wall Street, but at the time, second year in college, 9-11 happened um, and kind of changed my career path and view and perspective on life, wound up interning for my local council member who at eventually years later became a state senator. So went along with him at the state Senate. I served as land use director, chief of staff, worked on land use matters, and really had a bug for public service and giving back. Uh, I guess it's in my blood. I'm an Eagle Scout okay. from Staten Island. So Shout out to the um, Eagle Scouts, man. I was with a friend of yeah. mine yesterday. Sorry to interrupt, but I was with a friend of mine, Laura Vlacos, who was on the program last week and we were out at stony brook university yesterday and we were talking about eagle scouts because she used to be the chief operating officer of boy scouts out here on long island and i was saying like that story about the eagle scout man that that is a big honor and it is a big commitment when when those folks go out and do that eagle scout project right oh yeah thank you and i remember it well before turning age 17 18 around that time when you have to obtain your eagle the project that i did was to uh, support folks with disabilities on Staten Island. I made their parking lot and communal areas safer, uh, but worked on many Eagle projects with my friends and still some of my best friends today are uh, groups that I grew up with that are now Eagle Scouts, uh, which is, That's which so is great. great. Yeah, it's a big family. Staten Island? You grew up Born in Staten Island? Born New York. Yeah, I'm from Staten yeah. Island. Right uh, so it started 21 years ago in government. Um, and you mentioned some of uh, my career journey, I did serve as Director of Community Relations for the New York City Department of Homeless Services under the Bloomberg administration for three years. I was the project manager of the city's Hope Count. That's a street survey uh, for those living on the street annually that's held in New York City and major cities around the country. Um, it's the largest street survey of homeless um, in, in, the, in the United States. Uh, so I was project manager for that for three years. And while I served in that role at Homeless Services, Superstorm Sandy hit New York City. And I wound up joining our commissioner at the time, Seth Diamond, who went on to run the governor's office of storm recovery. I was a New York City regional lead supporting storm recovery efforts from the state in Staten Island, Lower Manhattan, Red Hook, East Bronx, and the Coney Island Peninsula. Wound up managing um, at that office over $100 million in storm recovery projects, including uh, this really exciting project off the South Shore of Staten Island called Living Breakwaters that uses oysters and artificial reefs uh, to combat the effects of climate change and sea level rise. And then from there, um, after serving four years at the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, I found my way to Jamaica Bay and Rockaway Parks uh, and served as executive director for nearly six years 
at the Jamaica Bay Rockway Parks Conservancy, where we supported 10,000 acres of city, state, and federal parkland across Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, many of your viewers might know Rockaway Beach, famous surfing beach in New York City, also one of the songs from the Ramones, um, yes. and and uh, Floyd Bennett Field, Jacob Reese Park. So real national treasures and and important places in terms of our city's open spaces, but also recreational areas. And after doing that for six years, we got a lot accomplished, grew the organization from just a single staff member to six full-time staff members, multi-million dollar budget, uh, engaging 10,000 thousands of school students, I should say, um, through our education programs. We had just built a brand new living shoreline at the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge, created nine new acres of habitat uh, right before I had left the conservancy. And I felt um, that I had gotten the conservancy to a good place. And anyone that's in the nonprofit sector knows um, when it's your time to kind of pass the baton on to someone else to continue growing the organization and fulfilling its mission, um, it's maybe time to move on. And I was very inspired in the work that I did at the Conservancy, not just in Parkland, but working with people. Um, and as you can see through my career journey, really starting 20 years ago, it has always been around engaging in, and serving the public. Um, and an opportunity arose to come and serve as the executive director of the Public Housing Community Fund, then known as the Fund for Public Housing, went right. through a name change. And um, I could talk more about the organization in a few moments, but yeah. that's how I wound up here today. And it's and been an honor and a privilege to serve at the fund uh, since June of 2022. I love that. We got a lot to talk about the fund. I do want to go back a little bit because, I mean, I'm taken by your your body of work. And it's it's funny, like, I forget, I just saw an interview recently and and I think it was like, um, oh, you know what it was? It was Jennifer Lopez. Somebody was like a quick soundbite, right? Shout out to J-Lo, Jenny from the block. I understand, Jenny. I'm just Tommy from the block at the end of the day, too. I totally get it. So um, I, she, she, I make myself laugh, Alex. You know, she was being asked, like, you know, how can you describe your body of work? And she was like, I'm still doing it. Like, she, you know, like she's going to be doing this another 30 some odd years, right? Performing. She's like, I'm still in it. So she was kind of like, it was like a cute little quip, like, I'm still doing the body work, but you, when I talk about what you've accomplished, you know, as a public servant, to me, it, it, these are the people I like to spend my time with. Like, even if I think professionally from Vanguard's perspective, Vanguard Benefits, you know, we, we thought we wanted to work in the nonprofit sector. And I'll tell you the truth. I don't know if I knew what that meant seven years ago. And, you know, realizing it every single day is I get to hang out with people like you who are changing the world every day, who are making the world a better place people like that are on your team, people like you said, you you brought the organization, you know, Jamaica Bay Rockaway Parks Conservancy to a certain point, growth from one to six people, you know, grew the, the budget of the organization and it was time to move on and let somebody else take it over. But game changing things, um, just changing the opportunities that are out there for the world. And it's people like you. And, and again, I know as a nonprofit leader, everybody's like, hey, man, it's not about me. It's about the team. Of course, it's about the team, right? But I can't interview nine people at a time because I wouldn't be able to get, keep the conversation going. So the <laughs> point is, thank you for what you do. I do have some questions. We are going to go to break in a sec, but I do have questions about like, you know, just the the, the Jamaica Bay, uh, the, the Rockaway Parks piece there, like, Getting involved in nature, how important was that to you? We're going to hold off on the break. We're going to keep going for a second. But what what was the importance there? Yes, we're going to talk about people, 525,000 people that your organization now serves. But what, what was it for you nature-wise? Was that also a big part of it? Maybe back to the Eagle Scout days? Yeah, well, I've it's in my blood, first off. Yes, always love being outdoors and supporting our parks, especially in New York City, um, which relies so heavily on our parks. Um, we saw this after COVID, but something I realized early on, um, that parks provide a great opportunity to improve physical and mental health, especially in lower income communities. Around Jamaica Bay and Rockaway, the allure there is that you have very historic parks created yeah. by Robert Moses, Right, many of them form military installations, and then areas that were heavily impacted by Superstorm Sandy. But the resilience um, that the Rockaway community, community of Howard Beach, um, and other areas of Brooklyn showed after Superstorm Sandy is that they were determined to build back and build back better. Yeah. Um, so I came to the Conservancy at a time in 2017 when the organization was still growing. Uh, it was very much a startup and the opportunity was endless. And the work that we did was not just around nature and exposing um, folks and visitors to all the wonderful places that Jamaica Bay and Rockaway Parks offer, but it was also about supporting people and especially young people from communities that often didn't have programs or services to expose them to nature. Like I had as a kid, 
had been exposed to, and then also providing educational opportunities to young people while we build really innovative, cool things in our parks, bring amazing art uh, to our park. So it was just an exciting moment in time that I had the opportunity uh, to participate in. It had a really great team and a wonderful and dedicated board and chair. And Tommy, to your point earlier, really great partners in government also um, on all yeah. three levels. We worked through public-private partnership with the National Park Service, with New York State Parks, with New York City Parks, with the Mayor's Office, and with the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. And all of those groups, along with community-based organizations that were really leading the charge, um, were able to work together to do great things for Jamaica Bay and Rockaway Parks, especially after the impacts of Superstorm Sandy. And, and that doesn't change now either. We're still seeing the effects of climate change. Um, yeah. So that's what brought me to the role and certainly is something that I experienced, yes, as a kid and as an Eagle Scout running through the woods and exploring nature. But um, I just think it's so important to support open space in our city. I love it. It is about open space gang. It's about, listen, get to nature. You know, there's, uh, for those of us who live kind of stressed out lives, you know, like human beings, like all of us, you know, those of us who, you know, it's sometimes, man, you just got to get away from the machines, get out into nature, see the birds. I didn't know this. I'm 46 years old. I never thought I'd be a birder. I don't know if I'm exactly a birder, but I do. When I see a bird, I like to go, oh, that's a beautiful bird. I wonder what kind of bird that is. And then I get, you know, into the looking, then I got to go look it up and see what kind of bird it is. But there's so much beauty around you, gang. Pick your head up out of the device and look around. He's ranting. He's raving again. I know. But look, pick your head up. Look around. I, you know, I want to go and visit, you know, the things down in Jamaica Bay that I've never visited before. Gang, just wherever you are, there's so much to see. Make a point of seeing it. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. Alex Zablocki, Tommy D, the show is Philanthropy and Focus. We'll be right back. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant. And on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you a high achieving growth oriented leader? Are you interested in developing your authentic leadership while creating a healthy, inclusive workplace? Hi, I'm Dr. Mira Bronku, host of The Hard Skills on talkradio.nyc at 5 p.m. Eastern on Tuesdays, where we discuss how leaders develop the hard skills needed to make a greater impact. We interview experts, have live coaching, and tackle these challenges. Listen to The Hard Skills on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy, and I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. <laughs> Listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Nonprofits need connections to move in good directions. So cut through all the static. Tommy in his attic. That's my friend, uh, my buddy, my pal. I spoke to him earlier this morning. Business development manager at the Queens Chamber of Commerce, Brendan Levy, lead singer of Damaged Goods. I will be out tomorrow night seeing Damaged Goods. Um, Not just any Damaged Goods, I might, but the band Damaged Goods. Um, So send me a note if you're interested, gang. Um, I'll be out seeing Brendan's band tomorrow night. Tommy D dot NYC on the Instagram. You can always check me out on there. Send me a little note. I'm not really sure how I'm figuring out how to use the messaging feature on there. I used to think it was just, I post pictures and hope people like them. But now I realize like people, you know, it's funny how it's like, I used to think Facebook was like a way like you and I would connect and then we'd actually just move off of Facebook and have a phone call. I didn't realize like the whole world, not the whole world, but a lot of the world, like they actually, that's their communication. Like Alex and Tommy might keep in touch on Facebook all the time and never talk. 
I always thought it was just like leading towards the phone conversation. So my, I'm, I'm old, I guess, but I'm realizing, I don't know if you can relate to that, but I'm realizing. It's a new way to communicate. Yeah. I mean, people will get, find me on LinkedIn and have a conversation every now and then you get an Instagram message, Facebook uh, text message. I guess there's many different ways that people communicate, but of course, yeah, they're finding, finding myself on Instagram or, or organization and always messaging, especially residents of public so shout out to, While we're on that, to shout out to how can they follow you and get connected to the, to the fund? Yeah, we're Instagram at Community Fund NYC. So all of our social handles are Community Fund uh, NYC, except for Twitter or X, uh, now known as X. It's Community Fund NY on X because of the character limit. Um, but you can find us on all the social media platforms, including TikTok. Love it. Yeah, we're actually streaming right now. I got to look at my notes. We're streaming on LinkedIn. We're streaming on Facebook. We're streaming on Twitch. We're streaming on formerly known as Twitter. It's like Prince, the artist formerly known as Twitter, you know, and uh, and then also on YouTube. And uh, I mean, we're all over the place. I There's a couple people like that check in playing games like they're gamers and they're like listening to philanthropy and focus on Twitch. Who knew I would have that that sort of appeal? You know, people are like playing Fortnite or whatever and listening listen to the kid talk about nonprofits. I, I just That's great. Love it. Isn't that just great how the reach is? So I was check I was kind of chatting with you because I was on the Intrepid a couple last week when the kids were off from school. We took a uh, gang the Intrepid Museum, you know, in New York City. Um former, you know, aircraft carrier that it was still an aircraft carrier but it's not being used anymore i guess the right word is decommissioned but we i took the kids in my wife and i went on a trip and it happened to be like kids week because the kids were off at school and one of the nonprofits that was there i just hit in the chat um is the billion oyster project and it's something you brought up in that last segment there where i promise gang we're going to get into the fund but i also want to hear alex just sort of some of that stuff because you said you worked with them for years and you sort of also mentioned some of the experience you had in the past you know uh with the conservancy um so let's talk about that a little bit because with the oysters and stuff they're not they're not just for eating apparently i guess huh no i i love oysters but we don't eat oysters from new york city waters maybe out in long island where you are from the yeah. sound uh they're safe but the Billion Oyster Project is an incredible organization, nonprofit based here in New York City that I've been working with since 2023, so nearly a decade now. Um, I can't speak uh, more highly about their work. Uh, they really are incredible, uh, doing a lot of work in New York City schools and along the waterfront with the goal of uh, restoring a billion oysters in New York City's waters over the next few decades. But I got to know them at my work at the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. We were partners on the li that Living Breakwaters project off the South Shore of Staten Island. So it's seeded with oysters. Um, and not only is it about uh, providing resilience and attenuating wave action along the shoreline using natural fe features like oysters in the water, and of course, that will do a lot for the environment. But what's great about the Billion Oyster Projects, they have such a robust um, on the ground education program. Uh, so they have these systems set up with schools across New York City waterfront and students are learning how oysters grow and what it means in terms of the ecosystem. Um, but then they're learning science skills, they work on art, uh, they're working on mathematics, so all of the STEAM-based curriculum. And they have a really cool place on Governor's Island. Uh, Tommy, you should go there with your family yeah, one day. Let's um, do it. They have the Harbor School and they grow oysters there. Um, and they're doing this work um, now expanding all over the five boroughs. Uh, and again, I, I can't speak more about them other than uh, just how great they are. And, and they're a really good partner. I love it. And so, gang, I, well, here's the thing. Here's what I want you all to do is check out BillionOysterProject.org, BillionOysterProject.org. And Alex, I'm going to ask you the first to ask of the show. I'd love it if you could hook me up with some leadership over there and have them come on here on Philanthropy and Focus. I'm, I have a quarter of 5,000 shows. I told you at the upfront, man, I got a lot of got a lot of shows to do. So it'd be awesome. I'll do that. And Pre if so, well, let's do this. And if Jay, because I know there's like a music theme going on with your show, if J Lo is listening, um, we, <laughs> yes. we want to connect J Lo. Maybe we'll do all three of us together. And then we'll bring on Billion Oyster Project. We'll get you connected uh, with them by this 100%. afternoon. 100%. I appreciate you for doing that. We'll get them on the show probably, you know, if they're available, we'll do it in April. What I'd love to do too is get out. I do these service projects where I like to get out in the community and do, I called it 60 days of service, which I did that already. So we got to start a new number, but I, you know, getting out and doing that, being on the, I have this whole idea, Alex, and then we get into the fund, but I have this whole idea of taking what philanthropy and focus is, but doing it as a TV show. You remember the show? Um, you ever see that show, Dirty Jobs with that guy? Yeah, um, of course. Yep. I can't think of his name. Mike Rowe. Mike Rowe. So like, I just, I have a, a camera guy. He's a film student, a guy named Samir. He's going to um, City College. 
And uh, I was out with him the other night and I, I, I'm going to go on the road and just do these shows. Maybe I could do something with the fun. Maybe I just come on. We, you know, he records whatever antics we get into, whatever. And, you know, whatever, because to me, I want to just continue to show what these organizations are doing in real life, in real time. Let's move on from Billy and Oyster. Let's go back to Alex and the fund. When you made this move to this organization, that is an organization that the, this is an organization in tandem with NYCHA, which you'll explain to me in a second, but one in 17 New Yorkers lives in NYCHA housing, correct me if I'm wrong, at 525,000 New Yorkers. So if I'm off on any statistics, please correct me. But what exactly, when you came over to this organization, how familiar were you with the work that the, the organization is doing? And what was it that drew you over and, and kind of give me a day in the life of what you all are doing? Sure. I was familiar with, with the work, uh, familiar with the authority. Uh, my family had lived in public housing for 11 years, way back when in the 50s and 60s in Brooklyn. Um, so had that connection, but understood what NYCHA meant to the city, um, how important the housing that NYCHA provides in all five boroughs of New York City, um, the importance that played, and then also the great contribution public housing residents were already making to the city. And now being in this role, I understand that even better. Um, but you are right, the New York City Housing Authority supports over half a million residents, over 525,000 to be exact, one in every 17 New Yorkers living in public housing across the five boroughs. And the New York City Housing Authority, or NYCHA, is the largest and oldest public housing authority in North America. So the first public housing development that was built in North America was built right here in Manhattan on the Lower East Side called First Houses. Eleanor Roosevelt joined Mayor LaGuardia to break ground um, over 90 years ago on that development. And since then, it has grown and now is a city within a city. Um, larger than the city of Orlando um, mm. in terms of size or Boston um, within New York City. But what we're seeing in NYCHA communities um, is really the economic engine of our city, the heart of our city, um, folks that have lived in public housing for sometimes generations, or it could be transitional in many respects, where they're moving into public housing and eventually transition out when they find economic mobility. But NYCHA is also supporting um, a community that's making on average um, income of $25,000 a year, roughly per family. Uh, so very low income. And a lot of these communities are in environmental justice areas. They're facing a lot of health issues. So we're here at the fund to respond to a lot of um, the issues that residents are facing in community, but also provide opportunity in terms of programming to lift up these communities and give them the opportunity to find economic mobility, explore new career paths, as an example, build leadership skills, um, and also get the financial tools they need uh, to be successful. And we invest in public housing residents and their communities. So that's that's the piece that stands out for me. You invest in the residents and the communities. So it, you know, if I'm understanding correctly, you're advocating on behalf of the health of these individuals, the economic growth of these individuals, education of these individuals, 525,000 constituents, right? That are that are people that your organization advocates on behalf of. Is that am I, is advocate the right word? Support? What? Yeah, we, we support them. Look, our, our vision is to build a stronger, more equitable New York City by investing in public housing communities. And that means the dollars that we raise go towards programs that support the residents of public housing. And we do that through four key areas, Tommy, so you're right. Um, we invest in programs focused on community health, workforce training that also includes supporting NYCHA's entrepreneurs. There are thousands of them. Uh, leadership development programs, which I can get to in more detail, and then financial empowerment programs. So those are the four main pillars, and we're out there each and every day um, getting foundations, corporations to donate funds to support these programs. And then we launch high impact programs, um, we always like to say that we sometimes pilot things and then we like to scale them. NYCHA is so large that we can't possibly serve all half a million residents at once. Right. So we invest in programs, we we uh, launch them, we evaluate them, and then we scale them up, hopefully to all 335 NYCHA developments across the five boroughs. So that's that's really what we're driven by here at the fund. So a couple of things, we're going to take a break in a second, but a couple of things that are going to come up for us in the next segment is collaboration. I mean, you are you are a smaller organization, so you must have co collaboration and partners in, in these. You said 335 properties. Is that what you said? Yes, 335 developments across all five boroughs. Developments. Yep. Okay, all five boroughs covered. Got it. All right, so we have a lot to unpack, certainly about these four pillars, health, workforce development, leadership development, 
and then also uh, economic empowerment. So there's there's so much here. We're going to take a quick break. It's got to be a quick break, gang. Don't give me too many commercials on this break. Quick break. Right back. Alex and Tommy D. Philanthropy and Focus. See you in a minute. Hey, everybody. It's Tommy D., the nonprofit sector connector, coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy and Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. Were you an essential worker during the pandemic? If you needed to learn stages of epilepsy, did you depend on advocates? Did you use new innovations to cope with mental and neurological issues? Maintaining high quality of life and keeping good mental health are what we all strive for. I'm Frank R. Harrison, host of Frank About Health, and each week, top healthcare influencers, professionals, and innovators answer these questions and more. Stay tuned on Thursdays at 5 p.m. on talkradio.nyc, and I will continue to be Frank About Health with all of you. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy, and I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Nonprofits need connections to move in good directions. So cut through all the static. Join Tommy in his attic. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. The, uh, the organization is Public Housing Community Fund. The leader is Alex Zablocki. And the nonprofit sector connector is your boy, Tommy D. Four things, community health, financial empowerment, gang. By the way, I'm sharing the website. If you're watching and streaming, you see that. If you don't, go to communityfund.nyc, communityfund.nyc. But those four pillars that Alex and I are going to jump into now, community health, financial empowerment, leadership development, and workforce training check that out check out their website reach out to me alex will send you you know alex will share his contact information again later in the show how to follow them on social all that type of stuff but we need to dive into these pieces so impacting these individuals really I, I, you know let me read it say the, the uh i want to read it again we're building a strong more equitable new york city right on alex so take it away tell us about these programs please sir yeah, and as I said earlier, we are building a stronger, more equitable city by investing in public housing communities, and that's what we're here to do. So, you know, NYCHA right now um, is doing a lot of work to invest in its infrastructure. There's a $78 billion need that the New York City Housing Authority has to keep up with its buildings and the deferred maintenance over the years. And a lot of this is due to decades of federal disinvestment. So as NYCHA has been disinvested or lack of invested in in types of uh, in terms of its uh, development needs, um, they have been not able to raise the funds necessary uh, for program activity. So that's why we were created in 2016. Um, and as I mentioned, we focus on community health, leadership development, workforce training, and financial empowerment as um, the main four main key pillars uh, for program development. And one of the things that um, we're focusing the most on right now and have a 10-year plan around to impact the most number of NYCHA residents to improve community health, both physical mental health, also the community su uh, sustainability and resilience is investing in NYCHA's open spaces art mm -hmm. and community centers. And that comes under our community health pillar. Uh, so we have a real innovative program called Green Space Connections, where we're engaging uh, residents in participatory design in four communities, two in the Bronx and two in Brooklyn, uh, to meet the needs of current residents and then invest millions of dollars in their open spaces. And in those four communities alone, just in terms of impact, it's 14,000 residents that live in those four communities. But we've done other work in open space. We transformed- I was going to pause you for a second, because I think I know, but when you say open spaces, can you give a little definition around that so we can grab that one? 
Yeah, the way that NYCHA is built, it's it's this tower in the park model. So a lot of NYCHA developments across the five boroughs um, have a lot of density through a building. Let's say it's a mid-rise or high-rise, and then a lot of open space around it. So these campuses act as lungs of our city, uh, providing green space in areas that, that don't have that much parkland. Um, so NYCHA itself is home to ballparks, uh, basketball uh, courts, playgrounds, just places for community to gather in. Um, but through decades of disinvestment um, by way of the federal government, a lot of these spaces have not been well maintained. And also the populations have changed in public housing. So where a top playground might have been relevant in a community 20 years ago, we now have an aging population in public housing. The need might be different. So what we do is we raise money uh, to invest in these spaces, but we do it through a participatory process that's led by the residents themselves. So everything that we do is focused around residents. So they lead the design process. Um, and then we invest in the outcomes of that process in partnership with the New York City Housing Authority. And we believe that these projects uh, will transform community, obviously bring about pride and improve quality of life, but also improve community health in terms of mental, physical health, again, resilience, sustainability, and a place to, uh, and way to bring community together and improve community safety. Yeah. You know, I, I get what better way to have the community be a part and parcel of building the community. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a silly statement, but the whole thing is like the community built the community, Tommy. Yeah. Well, this is who lives there. These are the people who have the, 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 relatively speaking, ownership of the of where they live, they should want to support it, you know, whether they don't actually own the, the, the physical building where they live in, but the ownership in the sense of belonging. And, um, you, you know, I see that in my mind's eye, the participatory nature of what you're talking about, you know, people getting out there doing the work. And also, you know, I, I, an agency doesn't always know what the community needs, right? So you must react to what they need and then bring resources. Isn't that the best way to do it? Yeah, the residents know best. And what's great about the authority's transformation plan is that they've really embedded resident engagement and the role of residents in all of the things that the authority is now doing. So on the policy side, and the bigger picture, restoring buildings, maintaining things like elevators, building mechanicals, things that we don't focus on, right? right. The buildings themselves. NYCHA is working with residents across the five boroughs and working on innovative ways to bring those investments into community. At the Public Housing Community Fund, we take those same concepts and ideals um, and even take it a step further and ensure that residents are not only the focus, but the centerpiece of all the work we do. So as you look at not only work in terms of uh, investing in NYCHA's open spaces through community-led process, but even our leadership development programs are all around engaging residents in, in leadership skills, exposing them to new or uh, existing career pathways that they might want to be exposed to, higher education opportunities, providing scholarships to residents. On the workforce side, we're really responding to the needs of residents in terms of what types of careers they would want to explore. So we're not making that decision for them. Um, we're saying this is a sector that's growing. NYCHA residents have shown interest in this space, and then we respond with program. Um, so everything we do is centered around that. And our board, Tommy, also includes residents of NYCHA. Um, that help guide us as well, yeah. along with with private I noticed that the other day. On our board. I, sorry to interrupt you. I noticed that the other day when I was looking on the website, and how critically important is that? Because again, this is the community that can inform the change that's needed, right? It's it's not look many nonprofit organizations get the big wig from X Y Z bank or X Y Z multinational, right? Because maybe they can bring funds and whatnot, and probably they can bring funds and. What's important is the, the you know I have a, a very, very good friends at um, an organization which is a FQHC a federally qualified health center out here on Long Island called Harmony Healthcare, and they serve um, populations that they don't turn anybody away from medical services and often they're serving populations of people who are uninsured underinsured just don't have access, and nobody gets turned away, and their board is also made up of the people that they serve. What part of part of the board is made up of the people that they're serving? Which because again we. <laughs> We still need the people to bring some money sometimes to these nonprofit boards. We know that as well. Uh, I just think it's, it, you know, the way you go about this work seems the, like it's the right way to me, Alex. I mean, nothing's perfect, but this is to me is it's very informed to uh, 
to the way things should be. What do you say kind of about, I mean, it's your, you're running the organization, so I'm sure. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, look, it's not perfect, but it gets better every day. Um, and you mentioned earlier about partnership. You know, we not only partner with organizations to do this work because we are a very lean team, um, and we partner, of course, with government um, agencies and the authority itself. But our greatest partners are NYCHA residents. Uh, so when we talk about the work we do, we really are their champion, um, yeah. and they're helping lead this effort. So you're right in the nonprofit space, and your viewers know this. You have to have a board that's going to raise money. Um, we are here to raise funds, right? To to go forth with our mission of serving public housing residents. We can't do that without funding. Sure. Um, but NYCHA residents, not only on our board, but our supporters in the community, participants in our program, and those advisors that we lean heavily on and speak to every single day that live in NYCHA communities and know the community best are really our greatest spokespeople. Um, and quite frankly, are why we get to bring in the funding because NYCHA communities are worth investing in. There's such a great need that communities have, uh, public housing communities have in New York City um, that we need to bring more resources to and fill those gaps. Um, and you can see that out of this small city within a city, these 525,000 residents, they really are leading the way um, in terms of the city's economic engine, especially during COVID, they were going to work. Um, these are wonderful New Yorkers who, as I said, many generations have lived in these communities uh, for for some time now. And we want to support that and make sure that public housing is a resource that New York City has for generations to come. I want you to talk to me, Alex. Thank you for all that. I want you to talk to me about this whole piece on, uh, I wrote it down, but around workforce and the entrepreneurship of, of people living in in, uh, in NYCHA housing and, and you know, people that you guys are connected to, please. Yeah, well, look, it's it's exciting right now. There's there's a lot going on in the technology space, especially around AI. Um, and what we're focused on is is not just careers in tech or those those opportunities that could really find someone economic mobility, not just a minimum wage job, but right a real career path towards a high paying job with great wages and benefits. Um, but we're mostly focused on the clean energy sector, those green jobs that are growing at a rapid pace in New York City. And NYCHA is actually leading the way in really? terms of decarbonizing its buildings. Yeah, they're, um, I would say uh, the innovation that's coming out of NYCHA right now is unprecedented. And the public sector um, through NYCHA is leading the private sector in many respects in terms of decarbonizing. We're working with NYCHA right now on this electrified heating system called heat pumps that are being installed. And we're training through our NYCHA Clean Energy Academy, NYCHA residents to be the workforce that will install these heat pumps and also make our buildings energy efficient, installing solar at scale across NYCHA developments. Um, so that's just on the workforce side. So we like to offer programs and opportunities that aren't minimum wage jobs. They're, they're not gonna be entry level, but these are great, High paying, maybe even union jobs uh, with benefits. Career. You're giving careers to a career, right? Not yeah. another gig where I got to go do this thing to get, and then maybe I'll get another yeah. gig, but a, a real career. And, and you know, but not everyone um, wants to pursue a career in technology or the clean energy space. So we do support also NYCHA's entrepreneurs. And there are thousands of them. Our three main programs that we support along with NYCHA is childcare food and construction business pathways. These are programs that if you have a side hustle, uh, you, you have been baking cookies in your apartment and selling them to your neighbors and you want to formalize that business, or maybe you have a home-based child care uh, program where you've been taking care of a few kids in a development and you want to formalize that and get licensed for that work, or you have a side hustle, you're a painter or a carpenter, maybe you've done some plumbing work. You're like, I want to make a business out of this. I I should be able to compete for contracts that NYCHA is putting out so I can benefit from all of this investment as well. So these three programs work uh, through a cohort model uh, to support entrepreneurs living in public housing that want to formalize their business. And um, hundreds of residents, not thousands, have gone through these programs. And in that ecosystem, we do, Tommy, is when we have a need for like food for a meeting or we need to reach out to someone, we're also purchasing from our graduates. So we're keeping within the family and supporting those businesses. Uh, so it's really exciting with workforce side and we're also supporting our entrepreneurs and NYCHA in those three tracks. I don't know if you've ever connected with my good friend Michael Pardis. Michael is uh, runs a he's the executive director of Red Hook Initiative. But prior to that, Michael and I knew each other. We um, studied together at the Institute for Nonprofit Practice, 
And um, he would, when we were together there, he was running uh, Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative, BCDI, in the South Bronx. And there was this whole focus on the cohort programs, as well as, um, you know, the, the community involvement and really propping mm-hmm. folks up and giving them opportunities from an entrepreneurial perspective. So if you don't know Michael, we need to get you connected to Michael. He's uh, He's been on the show. Actually, he was on the show when he was with BCDI. So we've got to get him on the show for the Red Hook Initiative. Um, but just he's just an incredible community leader. Um, uh, grew up in the Bronx and if I'm not mistaken, grew up in NYCHA housing and has a very strong focus on service work. Have you ever met? Do you know the name? Yeah, I know we we love RHI. We're in Red Hook all the time. Uh, Karen Blondell, shout out, is the NYCHA resident leader from Red Hook West and is on our board. Um, and Tommy, we're going to be installing an incredible mural at that community um, from April to May of this year. And there's a technology piece to it. I won't give it away on your show, but we'll love to have you come out uh, with your videographer I'll, I'll and help us paint. Show. I would love yeah. to. And, you know, shout out to the Spirit of Huntington Art Center, which is an organization I sit on the board of. I wanted to tell you about. I don't know if we'll get into it today. But that's why we always have to have the meeting after the meeting. But I'd love to be involved with the uh, to see the mural, to witness what's going on out there. And, you know, we got to take a quick break. So we'll be back when we come back. I we I mean, there's so much here, Alex. This is but this is the story of my show. We always run out of uh, time before we run out of words. Let's come back. We'll finish off. We're going to talk about what's upcoming. I want to talk about this arts program that you have that you you and i you did share with me uh kind of offline the show is philanthropy and focus alex and tommy in the attic virtually in the attic he's not really in my attic over here but you know what i mean gang all right we'll be right back are you a high achieving growth oriented leader are you interested in developing your authentic leadership while creating a healthy inclusive workplace hi i'm dr mira bronco host of the hard skills on talkradio.nyc at 5 p.m eastern on tuesdays where we discuss how leaders develop the hard skills needed to make a greater impact. We interview experts, have live coaching, and tackle these challenges. Listen to the hard skills on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Hey, everybody. It's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector, coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy and Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Nonprofits need connections to move in good directions. So cut through all the static. Join Tommy in his attic. Yo, it's funny, my producer just drops a note in the chat and says, get ready for the lightning round. This is the lightning round. Bing, 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 bing. There's a lightning round, gang. This is when I've known that I have so many more things I want to talk about, and i got about eight minutes to do it. So, Alex, let's. I want to make sure we hit upon any of the, the top programs, the top tiers, those, uh, those four tenets that you've talked about. Anything you want to say about that? And then I want to hear about the arts and anything else coming up before we head out of here. Yeah, quick, quickly, we uh, we support hundreds of youth through youth-centered leadership development programs in partnership with NYU, City Tech for architecture programs, NYU is on real estate. We have a youth tech core program that's intergenerational. Where we teach technology skills to NYCHA residents um, ages 14 plus and connect them with adult leaders to solve community communication problems using technology. We also, Tommy, raise funds to support a NYCHA CUNY scholarship program. So residents that are in CUNY, undergrad or graduate school, can apply for a scholarship. We gave out 79 of those last year, a record. Um, And we do a lot more at the fund. Everyone can find out about the work that we do and how we're looking to partner with organizations that are in this space and provide opportunity to residents uh, by going to communityfund.com 
www.mypromise.nyc. And I am happy to talk about the art program if you, I if you have I want to talk about it, but before you say that, I want to remind everybody, gang, you know, in a world where not everybody should be going to college. Oh my God, he said that. But in a world where not everybody should be going to college, we certainly, we need people in our trades. We need people in, in other work. However, if you are college bound, man, the SUNY schools and the CUNY schools, what a deal. You can get an incredible education, you know, without having to have that private cost and those loans and things like that. Alex graduating from Baruch. I mean, you know all about it. I did not graduate from Baruch, although I did attend Baruch. However, I was also attending my job, which was as a bartender at the time. So it was very difficult getting home at 4 a.m. from uh, the bar and then getting to a seven o'clock calculus class. And I will tell you this. You, I don't know who you are, but if you were Tommy D, you can't miss calculus six weeks in a row and then show up as if nothing happened and like think you know how it, it was almost like has I had I not gone to Mandarin class for like six weeks in a row because I didn't even understand what they were saying when I got back. Anyway, that's that's my story. Shout out to SUNY Old Westbury where I did get my degree in finance. So Alex, let's I want to hear about the art. I want because it was something that that was sort of the catalyst almost to having you on the show because you brought it to me from a business perspective about what's going on in the new program and tell us about that please. Yeah, we're we're doing a few things around art. So first off, we're looking to incorporate art in a lot of the open space work we're doing. So this would be resident led ideas uh, we worked in partnership with another nonprofit, uh, Center for Justice Innovation, to install an incredible mural in the Bronx uh, at Patterson Houses um, that shows these famous faces from Patterson and then current residents. Um, it really brings a lot of pride to the community. It's in the central space. And it was all community designed uh, with an incredible artist, uh, Joel Berger from Art Illusion in the Bronx. So that's just one piece, but we've taken that a step further. We raised $2 million uh, last year to support restoration of a historic piece of artwork. So if some of you may not know this, but when NYCHA was first developed in the 30s and 40s during the WPA era out of the New Deal, um, a lot of amazing pieces of public artwork were installed in public housing communities, like you would see in some of our public hospitals or even some schools and other public open spaces. And like other things at NYCHA, due to federal disinvestment, a lot of these pieces of artwork are in disrepair. So um, NYCHA did advocate for funding through the city council to restore a historic piece of artwork from the Harlem Renaissance at Kingsborough Houses in Brooklyn. We helped fill the gap for that funding. I'm proud to report we broke ground in January. That frieze, which is 80 feet long by Richard Barté, is out of the Harlem Renaissance. It was designed in 1939 and placed in this community in 1941. So it's been there for over 80 years. That frieze is now being restored and the wall is being um, rebuilt. But connected to that, we have programmatic activities. So we're bringing in an artist in residence at Kingsborough and a fellow that's going to be a Kingsborough resident who will uh, collect stories through an oral history project and work with the artist in residence at Kingsborough. But Tommy, we're taking that a step further. So we raised- oh, I like it. Stay, Elevate, baby. Elevate, yeah. Alex. Well, we, we scale. So we raised an additional $3 million um, and we're bringing the artist in residence program to all five boroughs. Uh, so we'll be in Richmond Terrace Houses on Staten Island, we'll be in Bushwick in Brooklyn. We're gonna be at Astoria in Queens, King Towers in Manhattan and Bronx River in the Bronx. We will be hosting artists um, in all of these communities starting in July for 20 months. And the community decides what mediums they want to explore. Why is this important though? I, I mean, hey man, this is housing. This is public housing, Alex. I don't understand, I don't get it. Why is art important? Well, few reasons. First off, there's lack of programming. So just engagement around um, art programming and mediums community want to, wants to explore brings community together and gets them to experience something new. It is about improving community health, mental and physical health, community safety, and also creating social cohesion within these communities. So that's the main driver of it. But it's also, the program's called From Roots to Arts. It's about unlocking and enhancing and supporting the culture that already exists within public housing communities to give residents a voice through the arts around how they want to express themselves. So let's imagine there's residents that want to explore fashion mm -hmm. or dance in their community. The artists will be able to do that with them. And it's so robustly funded um, that we think will have really great outcomes over the 20 month residency that will prove itself out as we evaluate it and we'll be able to scale that. Uh, so hopefully through this pilot, we'll be able to scale from five communities to 10 to 15 to 20. Um, and it's something we're looking to do 
in open space in art and community centers across all five boroughs to hit all NYCHA campuses. So you raise the, the money time. and you raise the money. However, I would imagine like you'd love to kind of slap a logo on the side of this by somebody writing a big check, right? Is that possible? Like partnerships and relationships with corporates? Oh, well, definitely. They we're always looking for corporate sponsors, foundations to support us. Um, here, it's not necessarily tell me about um, putting someone's logo on something. Uh, obviously, we want to work with the right funding partners to support programs like this. So if anyone's out there listening, connect with us, um, especially around solving some community health issues using really innovative ways, such as investing in open space or the arts. Um, but we do work with really well-known brands and corporations. And to their credit, they're not always asking for credit. Okay. Um, it really oh, is wow. about the residents and and not about the press release or the photo op. We have some great donors um, that that we've had for multiple years, some newer donors. And this space has been really important to us in order to uh, help serve NYCHA communities. I love that. You know, um, I, and I love to hear that it's not always about just the, the photo op and the press release, you know, from the from the big corporates. It is about community. And that's great because behind the scenes, we know how important it is to, to serve our communities. Alex, we're running out of time. I have something to say at the end, but anything you want to say before we let it, how do they get in touch with you? I mean, we see on the screen communityfund.nyc and at communityfundnyc on the social media stuff. What, what else you want to leave them with? How to get you, how to get your team? Yeah, so I, I think one, I want to thank you, Tommy, but also thank anyone that's listening. Definitely go to communityfund.myc, find us on social. On our website, there's a NYCHA story section. If anyone wants to hear more from NYCHA residents directly about what NYCHA community means and what this big family means uh, to New York City and to us as an organization, check out those videos. Learn more about public housing, why it's important, and then understand why we need to invest in these communities to create a more equitable city. All right. And that's where we're going to leave it. Alex, I'm glad you're, you're, you're here. I'm glad you're telling the stories. I want to continue to have this story time with you. I want to come out in May and April and the murals and all the things. What I want to do is I haven't done this since 2022. Last year, every back in 22, every month I was um, sponsoring a membership into the Queens Chamber of Commerce because I feel so strongly about the Queens Chamber and my friend Tom Grass and my friend Brendan Levy. So what I want to do is I want to connect you with the chamber. I want to pay for your membership for the, for the first year for the public housing community fund so you can become a member and then leverage my relationships over there at the chamber. So if you accept- Thank you, Tommy. You're welcome. There it is. You're Thank a member you. of the Queens Chamber. We'll work it out behind the scenes. Gang, every single week here, we do a couple of things. I help nonprofit executive leaders tell their story and amplify their message. And whatever happened to the little guy who got everything he wanted, he lived happily ever after. I'm living that right now, man. I love what I do. I love this show. Alex, thanks again. Make it a great day, everybody. We'll see you next week right here. Philanthropy in focus. Bye. Bye. Nonprofits need connections to move in good directions. So cut through all the static. Join Tommy in his attic.